Please welcome a program manager from DARPA's Information Innovation Office, Mr. Wade Shen. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, you heard from me yesterday. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a program that we're running uh, in another office, uh, the Microsystems Technology Office, in order to build hardware to make uh, AI better. And uh, what I'm going to do first is uh, just to set the context for this particular talk and the work that we're doing in this program is to uh, give you a sense of why hardware matters when we're really talking about algorithms and software for most of the, the work that you've been seeing so far. So um, before I get into the details, I think it's important to understand that when we talk about applications that you've heard about uh, over the course of the last day and a half or so, um, all of the applications that you've heard about that are associated with AI, they have a compute story behind them. Uh, so, for instance, when we talk about self-driving cars, the dirty secret is that it takes a whole rack of GPUs in order to drive uh, a self-driving car, right? And when the first self-driving cars were built, right, the entire cargo space of the self-driving car was actually allocated to computers. And then trying to figure out how to cool those computers and all the, and all the compute requirements associated with this was, was really painful. Um, in an effort that uh, one of my colleagues, Mike Walker, ran called the Cyber Grand Challenge a couple of years ago, we had this challenge to build automated systems to protect a computer system through automated cyber defense measures largely driven by AI algorithms. And in that scenario, we ended up with a whole rack of computers to defend one single computer. Now, if you think about that for a moment, there's something a little bit disproportionate about uh, how much you need to defend versus what you're actually defending. And yesterday, I told you about a program called D3M, where we use machine learning to build machine learning and optimize machine learning. Well, it turns out that that program has resulted in the need for thousands of hours of compute time just to build a single model for a simple problem, a simple and small computer vision problem. So what you see here is that we're sort of on the edge of being able to do all of these really cool applications with AI. But each time that we want to do some new application, oftentimes what's really happening under the hood is that we as AI researchers are very limited in terms of the kinds of things we can explore because the amount of compute available to us is limited by uh, what the folks on, on the hardware side of the fence can do for us. Now, if you think about the progress in AI over the last couple of years, especially over the last two or three decades with the rise of deep learning, what's really happened in our field is kind of interesting. Uh, so when I look at uh, the field of, of deep learning, what I see is that we've had algorithms that we've had for 50 some odd years, namely deep neural networks of some kind. We've been able to train these networks better because we have access to a huge amount of labeled data in this last decade with the rise of data sources um, from Google, Facebook, and so on. And the combination of that plus computing has given us the capability to build bigger and better models. So over the last 15 years, just in the field of computer vision, we have reduced the error rates of, of, of our computer vision AI systems by over 80%. And the reason that we've been able to do that is because we've been able to build huge models. And largely, those models have become available to us because we have all of this labeled data that supports the training of these models and because we have ever-growing GPU capability that allows us to do more and more math faster and faster. Now, that seems great. And if you look at that curve, it looks exponential. And like all exponential curves in terms of growth, there really lies at the end of the day, right? At some point, these curves kind of go like this, and they level off. And that's what's happening to us. So when we look at the scaling that we get for free, when we look at our mathematical computation capabilities over the last couple of years, what's happening is that gradually, the scaling that we get for free from the physics of semiconductors has slowed down. And it's slowing down to the point where it's actually no longer really increasing in a serious way. 
So we went from every year having 50% increases without having to do redesigns in, in any significant way, just scaling our designs, right? Because the silicon made for us smaller and smaller transistors so we could pack more and more processing operations on a single processor in the early 2000s and late 90s to something like 23% a year over the last decade to now suddenly we're only growing by like 3% a year. Um, and this is a real problem for us because what it means is that those of us who think about how we build silicon now have to actually think harder about the problem. We can't just rely on physicists to give us better silicon to make bigger designs. Now we actually have to think about how to build smarter and smarter chips that can do more with less or with, without, without more die real estate anyway. So the opportunity for us is to do specialization. Okay, what I mean by specialization is that instead of building things that are generally just faster and scale out, what we want to do is figure out how to build things that are optimal for a particular algorithm. Now, at DARPA, there's been a long history of us building specialized processors for machine learning. It actually goes all the way back to 1989 uh, when we built one of the first uh, neural network processors. Uh, and over the course of the last 30 years, we have continued to, to poke at this uh, problem uh, by building other variants of specialized processors, the last of which was uh, in 2014 in the DARPA Synapse program. Um, that was a, essentially a, a DNN-like processor uh, done in partial analog. Now, what's kind of cool about all of these processors is that they uh, have the capability to be thousands of x faster uh, or thousands of times more energy efficient, but unfortunately, they also have the constraint that they can actually do only one thing. They can compute neural networks and nothing else. They can compute a particular kind of neural network. So if somebody changes, develops a new algorithm, these kinds of processors can't do anything uh, about those new algorithms without a substantial change in design. Um, and just to give you a sense of how bad this is, uh, when we look at how we specialize processors and what an optimal processor looks like, uh, it turns out that each algorithm requires a different kind of specialization. So the chart that you're, I'm showing you at the top of this uh, slide tells you a little bit about how you would allocate memory on a single chip. It turns out for different classes of algorithms, even algorithms that seem closely related, for instance, matrix multiply and matrix decomposition, the allocation of memory on chips that's optimal for that processing is not the same. And if you thought about this for a moment, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of algorithms that we use in the course of building machine learning uh, uh, tools. Uh, and if we really, really wanted to specialize each of those things, we'd have to pay the specialization cost in terms of the design for each of those algorithms. That's what the bottom half of the chart shows you. What it's saying here is that if you really want to do something optimally in silicon, you're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. Okay? And when you do that, you can only do that one thing really optimally. Now, I think a number of you uh, know something about uh, how we do uh, deep neural networks today, and you would say to me, hey, Wade, um, I think that all of what we're doing is really just linear algebra, so can't we just specialize that and be done with it? And the answer is no. Um, and the real answer why this is no is that linear algebra is not a monolithic thing in terms of how we actually compute it. So when you write down the math that says, I want to multiply a matrix A times B, or I want to take the inverse of a matrix A, right? it turns out it matters what the shape of that matrix is. And grossly, we can divide the world of matrices into two, two areas, things that are sparse, where the vast majority of the entries of that matrix are zero, and things that are dense, where the vast majority of the entries of that matrix are non-zero. And it turns out, depending on whether or not things are zero or non-zero and how sparse these matrices are, you'd actually do very different kinds of algorithms that express the same underlying math. So for instance, on the right side of the chart here, I'm showing you uh, what it actually takes to optimize two variants of matrix multiply that are mathematically still just matrix multiply, 
but because of the density of the, the matrices that you're multiplying, you would actually do allocations of, of architectures very differently. So yes, a lot of the math that we do in linear algebra, in, in, in AI and machine learning is linear algebra, but in practice, how we actually compute that linear algebra is very different uh, for different classes of matrices. And for almost all applications that we see today, uh, there's some mixture of, of sparsity and density that is driving the, the, the actual algorithms that we do. So what we want to do in our program in software-defined hardware is to figure out how we can have a different trade. So the trade that we have today is that we can have specialization, but that specialization pins us to very specific algorithms. We can't express very many algorithms, and one way to think about it is that these systems are not very programmable if we highly specialize them. Um, or we can have really bad performance, but really general purpose processing. And so what we get is this trade where we can have one or the other, but not both. What we want to do in software-defined hardware is to have our cake and eat it too, because um, we always do. And the idea is to build processors that allow us to generate things that look specialized at runtime, uh, but allow us to do so in such a way that we can still program them for new algorithms and for a, a variety of algorithms that we might want to run on those processors. So how do we do that? Well, the key intuition here is to go back and think a little bit about what we actually do when we build specialized processors. When we build specialized processors, what we're actually doing for the most part is that we're using some basic units that do mathematics, some basic, basic units that store data in memory. Um, so these systems are, so, uh, these components are sometimes called ALUs or arithmetic logic units, memory units. And what we're doing is we're reconfiguring them in interesting ways for the specific application of interest or the specific algorithm of interest. On the left side of this chart, I'm showing you two different ASICs that were built by two different groups. The top one was built by the folks at Princeton. The bottom one was built by the folks at MIT. And they do two different applications. At the end of the day, they're, they're doing some kind of dense and sparse linear algebra. On the top, it's, it's sparse linear algebra over graphs. And on the bottom, you can think of this as dense linear algebra or deep neural networks. And what you can see here is that the underlying components of these processors are actually very, very similar. What's different here is how they're arranged. Uh, so in the case of a, a graph processor, you would like to have uh, arithmetic logic units that compute addresses so that you can go and retrieve bits of external memory that are scattered uh, randomly across different locations. And because they're scattered differently, uh, randomly over different locations, you need more math on the front end of the process to actually gather, to figure out where you should go to gather these little bits of memory. Whereas in deep neural networks, you're typically retrieving large blocks of memory, and the driver is being able to do uh, matrix multiplies. And so what you have are memories that buffer uh, uh, the retrieval from off chip, and then a whole bunch of units that are, that are computing multiplication operations, because that's where the, the bottleneck is in, in that scenario. What we're trying to do in software-defined hardware is allow you to express both of these kinds of ASICs by building the basic building blocks uh, up front in our processor, but allowing you to reconfigure those building blocks in different ways, depending on the algorithm that you're actually running. So instead of committing to the configuration of these basic building blocks up front at design time, where if you made the wrong decision, you're going to pay a, a hundreds of millions of dollar cost, Let's defer this as late as possible, uh, in fact, all the way to runtime, so that we can make decisions about how to do this configuration optimally for the particular algorithm that we're actually running. It turns out that we do have to pay a cost for this, so it's not free. Doing reconfiguration is not a free operation. But in practice, what we find is that cost is not huge. It's on the order of like 2 or 3x. Um, and, and what that means is that we can still get the 500x gains associated with specialization without, uh, without sacrificing too much. So um, how do you actually make this possible? It turns out there's a whole bunch of details to making this possible. 
Um, and also, I should note that there are a couple of other differences. One is sort of how we access external memory. And you can see that in all of these processors, there's this sort of dark blue box that says, hey, we want to access stuff from outside. How do we do that? And that's often uh, quite different. So what we're doing in our program is trying to figure out how to build the right interconnects for these kinds of processors, how to build the right interfaces to external memory, uh, and then how to build programming systems that can allow us to exploit these kinds of processors without increasing the, uh, the burden on programmers. So the first result I'm going to show you about, or I'm going to tell you a little bit about, is uh, an underlying technology that makes this kind of reconfigurability possible. Um, so the folks at the University of Michigan working on our program have built a very, very fast reconfiguration system, essentially a crossbar that uses very low energy, uh, very little energy to every time it reconfigures, and it can be programmed essentially in one single cycle of a processor running at about a gigahertz. Now, when you can build such a fast reconfiguration system, you can actually start thinking about doing reconfiguration directly in the, in, in the algorithm as it's computing, which is kind of neat. So um, it turns out that this, this transmutation system that they've built through this fast crossbar allows us to build optimal FFTs where no memories are actually needed uh, between each stage of an FFT, which is typically the bottleneck for how FFTs are computed. So in, in signal processing and in, in a whole bunch of other applications, FFTs are sort of the core kernel that drive a lot of the work that we do. And in between each of these stages of FFTs, typically called butterfly stages, there's typically a storage memory that's required to write in and write out between the stages to communicate between processor, processing elements that are operating in parallel. Well, with fast transmutation, what you can do is compute. And while you're computing, change the configuration of how processors are connected to each other so that when compute is done, the data is ready and sitting at the next processor without actually having to have intermediate memories. What that means is that you can get very, very fast FFTs, like 10x faster um, and way lower energy because you don't actually have to write to the memories in between. Now, the other kind of application that this is really useful for are the sparse applications that I told you about before. So many of you probably know that AI recommendation systems are actually built on top of sparse matrix multiply. Um, and that sparse matrix multiply kernel is extremely important to get done very, very quickly. And it turns out that you can use transmutation in exactly the same way. So the concept is that while you're computing, uh, configure your crossbars to allow the data to move in flight while the computation is actually happening in parallel so that it's ready in an intermediate place in memory and that intermediate place is then immediately ready for the next stage of processing afterwards um, uh, in a data dependent way. Because these are sparse operations, the actual routing depends on the data itself. And so what you can do is configure as you see the data very, very quickly, resulting in almost no loss uh, of performance uh, in, in doing these kinds of operations. The net result of this kind of fast reconfiguration is that we can get 10 to 15x improvements uh, in terms of both of these kinds of operations, uh, and about 10x in terms of uh, energy efficiency gains. Now, the other problem I mentioned was the problem that we have various ways that we would like to access external memory. Now, it turns out that accessing external memories uh, in different algorithms is really, really expensive. So we have memories on chip. Accessing those memories on chip is usually pretty cheap. Doing some kind of computation on chip is usually pretty cheap. But in the realm of semiconductors, there's usually some kind of external out of processor memory that can hold a lot of data, and accessing those external memories is really, really expensive. Uh, it takes on the order of 100 cycles or 100 operations for us to be able to do that, and it's generally very, very expensive to transmit uh, the data across wires in terms of power. And so what we'd really like to do is to be able to build algorithms and build processing that allows us not to do this if we don't have to. Uh, 
And so what we've been working on in our program is the ability to move computation across the wire over to the memory side uh, in order to avoid the cost of actually uh, shipping large volumes of data to the processor. The way that we do this is that we build stacks of memory in the way that currently memories are built, and we couple those stacks of memory with transmutable processing elements on the memory stacks themselves. In this case, we do it with FPGAs, but you can imagine doing it with all sorts of processors. And the idea is that if we can ship some of the computation over to the memory side, we can reduce the amount of data we actually have to transmit to the processor itself and allow the processor only to process those things that are really hard to compute on the memory side because they require some kind of aggregation or because the math is too complicated for our FPGA. What we have found is that in practice, this kind of process results in 5x improvements in speed and 10x power improvements because we can reduce the amount of data that we actually need to transfer over the bus and do optimization and computation on the memory side. Now lastly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to make these systems programmable. Um, I told you that you know, even though the math that we write for sparse and dense operations looks the same, it turns out that actually realizing that math in an optimal way depends on the data, depends on the, it turns out it also depends on the underlying hardware architecture. And because we're building a hardware ar architecture that can change, uh, it's, it gets even more tricky for us because, you know, usually the way that this works is that we hire somebody to write code for a very specific architecture. We give them some amount of time. Uh, and then after some amount of time, they produce a very, very optimized implementation for a particular architectural variant. So if you give them 12 months, they can give you a GPU version of this, they can give you an Intel version of this, they can give you an AMD version of this, but it's a very expensive operation to do this and generally not feasible when you have a reconfigurable processor that can change all the time. So what we've been building is a smart compiler that tries to automate the job of this code ninja who usually does this kind of work. Um, the compiler is something that's being built by the folks at MIT. It's called TACO. And the idea is that a lot of the math that we do, whether it's sparse or dense, can actually be codified in terms of what we do to optimize the, the math implementation in the hardware. Um, typically, there's some kind of parallelization involved or some kind of tiling involved in order to match the kinds of memories that we have on die, and there's some kind of vectorization involved that allows us to do math jointly in vector units. And what we have found is that in doing this kind of automated compilation using TACO, we can actually get very, very close to ninja-like performance uh, without having to have ninjas at all in the process except at the at, at compile time uh, when, we, when we wrote the compiler. Um, and the difference is actually quite stark in terms of performance. So when we build this kind of optimal implementation, we typically can have hundreds of X improvement in terms of performance. And so it really matters that we have some mechanism to, uh, to do this kind of optimization. Otherwise, this kind of hardware is not actually that useful. Um, and thus the, the notion behind having this be software-defined hardware. But it's also important to make sure that programmer time is not wasted, right? So what we are not doing in this scenario is having programmers do this kind of optimization, which would be intractable. Now, our program has just started, um, so we're about six months into our program. Um, but we expect to have our first silicon for for this, uh, for this project uh, in the next uh, 18 months. And uh, what we think we can achieve is somewhere around 500x improvement in terms of efficiency and peak performance uh, for AI-like applications that range from sparse to dense computation. And so what we're hoping for is that many of you will find these, uh, these technologies useful. And most importantly, that this kind of hardware uh, improvement will drive new algorithms to be developed in AI that previously couldn't be developed because of computational limitations. Thank you very much.